You are listening to Inside the Notes. I'm your host, Erica Block. Here we have the opportunity to listen to the stories that connect our musical family tree. First-hand accounts of performances, musicians, and mentors that shape the way we listen, learn, and teach. On today's episode, we are talking with violinist Edwin Huizinga. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Edwin is in Bellingham for a performance of his project Fire and Grace, which he performs with guitarist William Coulter. Could you tell us a little bit about your project and how you met William? Uh, absolutely. Um, Fire and Grace is a violin and guitar duo. We specialize or love or perform Baroque and folk music together and have arranged a lots of rep around that passion that we have. I met William a few years ago in uh, in Cleveland, actually. Um, there was a really interesting Summerside concert series that was being put on by Apollo's Fire. And um, William was looking for a fiddler uh, for the project. And Jeanette Sorrell, the artistic director of Apollo's Fire, suggested me. And then he said, oh, no, that's a terrible idea because he plays, you know, classical music. <laughs> and uh, and then she was like, yeah, but, you know, you should maybe think about it. He loves to do other things. And then I think what happened was she sent him a YouTube video of me a backstage jamming with Mike Marshall, who's uh, so. who's a great mandolinist, and uh, and then uh, and then I think William was like, oh oh maybe this is this could work. Yeah. So so we ended up doing a, a really great project in Cleveland together with about seven shows, and then I ended up being hired to work with him on another project called A Celtic Christmas. Mm-hmm. Uh, which was then um, a touring program which happened every December. So we've done that together for a few years. And on that tour, we just started brainstorming about fun things we could try together. Cool. And, uh, and then, you know, the, the, it unfolded into this world where um, our main sort of thing that we do with Fire and Grace is we intertwine... Bach and folk music and so on the tour I had mentioned that Schumann wrote all these beautiful recording uh, beautiful um, sort of arrangements of um, accompaniments for the piano of all the solo Bach sonatas and partitas for for the violin and uh I don't feel like that's very common knowledge. No, I don't think I knew that. And uh, and they're gorgeous. And wow. I asked Bill to to play them on the guitar. And then that started that project. And then he was like, oh, you got to try this folk music out. And he's a brilliant Celtic guitarist. And so that rabbit hole happened. <laughs> and you just kind of dig and dig. So Fire and Grace, of the, the main concert, is a mixture of those kinds of different things. Like a folk tune or a Bach fusion tune and yeah. Schumann. Yeah, yeah. So, so our Liquid Gold Suite, which we've been working on for a couple of years, is literally um, the D minor partita, uh, the movements that go from that partita, and then in between each movement, we put an Irish tune, and it's cool. like a seamless sort of journey. Cool, that's awesome. And yeah. you've also included singers now, right? There's other we, versions of... Yeah, so Fire and Grace is, at the moment, yeah, it's... We just love working with friends. Mm-hmm. So, like, even last night, we were in Seattle, and we had our dear friend Ross Hauk, who's, like, an incredible Baroque tenor with just, like, a knack for folk music. And he... I mean, if there's a such thing as an Irish tenor, I think he would be one. Mm-hmm. And he has, so we invite people to join us. That's you know? awesome. And uh, tomorrow we have a guest in Ridgefield outside of, of Portland, and her name is Annie, Annie Stanyanek. And she's just been, she's a fiddler that's just been on tour for a couple of years with Rod Stewart. Wow. And like, that's it's fun. just a super amazing shredder. 
That's awesome. Yeah. And it's fun to be able to include your friends and kind of yeah. have each little project grow into different areas. Yeah, yeah. And have someone local. It's so fun to have someone local when you're on tour to join you. And it feels less like a, a strange city even. Mm-hmm. So how does it work in this group? Do you guys um, set out like a year in advance that you're going to do little four and five day stints in different places? Or do you have it kind of back up to a different gig that you've got going? Or how do you plan that with all your different schedules? Right. Well, it is it is complicated, as yeah. you can imagine. <laughs> and, and William is a, a full-time professor at... And, uh, or associate professor at UCSC okay. on the guitar, and he's also an engineer there, and um, a recording engineer. And so what we often do is we call, we get these quote-unquote anchor g- gigs. Mm-hmm. And so and we, ha- we have a management now, too, that we work with, uh, which is just a great friend of, of mine. Her name is Anna, and she has a very small one woman company called Summerall Arts. And uh, so she manages and, and, and is our agent and she helps us. And then of course we have our own connections. And so we just, we often find, you know, the anchor gig that we might have. And then we try to you build a small tour lit mm-hmm. based on that yeah. for exactly like you mentioned, three, four, five days and uh, it's usually a long weekend kind of vibe because weekends are great yeah. nights for shows. Yeah. Um, and then depending on the project, we uh, we kind of limit it to that. I mean, there are times where we've gone to like New Zealand or Ireland where we make them slightly longer tours mm-hmm. just because of the epicness yeah, the nature of the experience so those were more like two weeks but cool that's yeah. fabulous so i'd love to kind of take that and talk about your other projects i feel like you might be the most entrepreneurial person that we've gotten to talk to <laughs> so far there's so many projects but the cool. one i'm dying to hear about is your project in versailles oh, you were just doing recently right, yeah so you premiered a cantata is yeah. that right yeah how on earth did that come to be that's oh. the most epic thing I've ever seen pictures of. It oh. looks so cool. <laughs> yeah, it was really fun. Um, well, for for the last few years, I've been dabbling and getting really excited about composing. And so uh, a couple of years ago, the artistic director from this awesome Baroque company in Toronto, Baroque opera company called Opera Atelier, mm-hmm. Uh, my, uh, I, I would consider him a dear friend, Marshall Pinkowski, and his uh, wife, Jeanette Lajeunette Singh, they are co-artistic directors of this, of this amazing project. I think they're celebrating their 30th anniversary of the project. Wow. So, or of the company, I should say. And they, uh, so they invited me to write a piece of music, uh, for the first time they've ever, they ever asked me to do this was it was for just solo violin and dance, so I wrote a solo violin piece, um, and this amazing dancer Tyler Gledhill uh, choreographed movement to it, and it was about ten minutes long, and we premiered it in the Palace of Versailles, so cool. in the chapel, and that was about a year and a half ago okay. or two, and then that sort of grew into the concept of uh, writing a cantata. So about a year ago, we got permission from this um, uh, poet and writer in in New York to put one of her translations, uh, her English translations of a Rilke poem uh, into a piece of music. So I spent a few months uh, working on this new piece um i had never written for singers <laughs> and so this project was it was for um baritone and soprano and the two singers were our great friends of mine jesse bloomberg and mire Asselin. they're both like world-class soloists it's crazy how good they are and uh, and yeah for a small chamber ensemble 
uh, built up of Tafel music musicians. Fabulous. Um, so the ta- from the Tafel Music Baroque Orchestra, which is based in Toronto as well. And yeah, that, that was just an, an incredible project. And um, I don't know, I would love to encourage anyone listening to try out composition because we get caught up in playing music and playing what we are told to play, playing what we have to play, playing what pays our bills, and that's all amazing. But it is really fun to try to write something completely new, Absolutely. something that's just you know bouncing around in your head. And, um, and it's really, it was an amazing experience. The, the premiere was on December 1st, so just about six weeks ago. And, um, yeah, it was one of those moments that I will never forget. Yeah, it seems like a pinch me moment. And just being in that atmosphere at Versailles, it's so incredibly gorgeous and historical yeah. to then be premiering something. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, so do you, did you bite? Do you have the bug now? Are you going to write more? You know, have they I... Have already sucked you in for another one? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're definitely... The North American premiere is uh, next month in Toronto. Oh, fabulous. February 21st at the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, and uh, we have definitely started discussions of another cool. another poem to be set to music. And we've also started a longer discussion of what this might turn into. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the idea of writing... An opera is is scary, mm-hmm. but for now, the individual projects that I'm attempting and, and writing is is just absolutely amazing and exhilarating. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And and like you were saying with your unaccompanied piece, the dancing element really brought a whole new piece to it. Mm-hmm. So opera lends itself to so many opportunities like that where you can include different choreography and the costumes that yeah. you can bring it to life in a different way. Totally. And, I mean, let's be honest, in this day and age, we have to consider going outside the box of only, as a, as a musician, doing things that are oral like Mm -hmm. you know having dance kind of almost stir the mind and and having your your eyes help with the imagination and the magic and the the story is a huge thing Mm -hmm. I mean you know that's kind of why I think the world of video has just blown up and it's it's um, so normal now to just even listen to music with video. Right, you exactly. Know? It's like your people's laptops become the new stereo, you know, and with with video, and, and it's just amazing. So the, and also the first project with just solo violin and dance, I was actually also dancing, you know. Wow. And it much more rudimentary than than the professional dancer Tyler, but the fact that there was movement with, you know, while playing violin was also, I think, unique. Absolutely, and the audience um, is kind of reawakened to more. There's more going on. I can't yeah. just sit. I need to be more present yeah. to see all of this. It's very exciting. So, that's a lot of kind of new elements that you're bringing in. I saw also that you're di- part of Classical Revolution, yeah. which I love because we kind of are doing a mini version of that here, trying to play in bars and wineries oh, and things like that to try to get new listeners, mm-hmm. different listeners that might not be. I've had a lot of people over the years tell me they are afraid to go in a concert hall because they're not, they don't know what to expect and they don't want to look stupid and people who don't feel comfortable going in churches and all these venues that are more our traditional venues. Yeah. So being able to go in a cafe or a brewery, things like that, and still hear the good stuff, I think that's really important. So how did that all start for you? I, uh, I totally agree with everything you just said. Um, I did my master's degree at the San Francisco Conservatory mm-hmm. And I remember during my audition, uh, which was, of course, the year before I started, I met this guy in the hallway 
who, uh, his name was Cherith, and he is a violist, and he was just chatting, and we were like, oh, I wonder if there's a time to jam, like, it'd be so nice to, you know, just play some music, and then I, had, in my mind, I was already like, oh, this is the school I want to go to, <laughs> if we're talking about sight reading chair music, yeah. I'm in, so... Uh, we didn't find the time then, but we I remembered his name. And then when I started the following year, um, we reconnected and he had been dreaming about this idea of working uh, at this or going to this place called the Cla- uh, the Revolution Cafe. Okay. And it was on 21st uh, in between Valencia and Mission in the in the Mission District of San Francisco. So we showed up there one Sunday evening, and uh, I believe my friend Joe was working the bar. This would have been in 2006, and um, we just started playing chair music, and it was just the funnest thing ever. This tiny little bar, people brought out, you know, paper, they were writing or drawing, friends were hanging out. Um, and from that moment, we, we just made it a regular thing every Sunday night for two years while I was in school, we played chamber music from about 7 PM to 2 AM, you know, it was just brilliant. And I got to be such a great sight reader Absolutely. (laughs) and we met some of the coolest people. Um, and so much rep consumed. Yes. So much rep consumed. The Berlin Philharmonic would come through and some of the players there would just show up with their instruments and, you know, you'd sit down beside a violist and be like, I just want to say that you're like exceptionally good. (laughs) And they're like, yeah, we just had a concert. I'm in the Berlin Philharmonic. (laughs) You're like, yeah. And you're like, oh, that's really exceptional. And, (laughs) and, but also just locals that were like, oh, I went into tech but I love the violin, yeah. and then they're amazing yeah, at it. turns out they could know. have gone into music. Yeah, done anything. Yeah. So that was just a huge moment for me of realizing how important community was in mm-hmm. my world and in the mu- world of music. And and so then I moved back to Toronto a couple of years later and started something there. And as, a, as someone that tours internationally, I often bump into people that are making it happen wherever. I mean, it's an old idea, but it needs, everything needs reinventing or rekindling all the time for it to stay important and relevant. So, you know, I've, I've done this, um, with friends in Paris and Amsterdam and Berlin and many cities in North America. It's amazing. It's really cool. And I mean, we love pick up chamber music so much. So it's fun when you can be put in a place where other people are going to enjoy that as well. Yeah. And just see the process happen because there's so much energy and community in playing chamber music with people that you like yes. and friends and new people. So to have uh, kind of an audience of people who are already enjoying themselves, but also privy to that energy. I feel like it's infectious. If you yeah. can get yourself put in a place to see that happening. Absolutely. Yeah. It becomes much more fun. So all of this, it's so entrepreneurial. How did you ex- first experience that? Was that, was there a teacher? You went to Oberlin for your undergrad, right? Yeah. So was there a teacher there or anybody who helped kind of pry your mind open? Or have you always been like, I'm just going to do whatever I want, just doing it? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, at Oberlin, I studied with Marilyn McDonald. And it was pretty, like, serious, just... Sh- just like technique and figuring out how to play. And I wouldn't say I was, I had everything figured out yet. I was learning so much and I was really needing to focus on, on just the basics almost. Um, And she helped me a lot with that. Um, And I think at Oberlin, I realized that there were you know, so many people there that I would, that I love to play with, Mm -hmm. you know, and chamber music was a big part of the school. And of course I was in the Baroque orchestra and the contemporary music ensemble, as well as the, you know, um, regular sort of orchestra and just all those experiences were amazing. But I have to say, I didn't really do 
too much outside of the box, um, so to speak. Uh, I did witness a lot of things like the jazz program and and I was I was dabbling in trying to learn to improvise with certain people that I just thought were brilliant and but I don't think it was really until I left uh, uh, Oberlin and went to San Francisco that I I tried to be a musician mm -hmm. in the world and like started to learn how to set up a gig even and you know um as a as an educator now that uh, and someone that's really interested in in you know teaching i'm i'm i would like to find a way to um f dig myself into a place where i can help try new ways to set up these small programs of of helping people really get the knowledge they need to to be in this new sort of what I would consider a new world of mm -hmm. being an, an artist mm -hmm. because you need so many techniques and you have so many responsibilities if you want to make something happen and and I think I just always enjoy performing with people that I love as humans. Mm -hmm. I always enjoy having the opportunity to be myself when I perform. I've had a couple of interesting moments where I've been in an orchestra and been, you know, told to, you know, play less and conform to, uh, you know, the people around me. Um, and, and I mean, I'm not necessarily even saying like blend, a blend is a really important thing for me as well. But, um, I realized quickly after playing in various orchestras that I was maybe going to have to find my own way to not be, um, to not ever feel like I couldn't be who I, who I was, right. who I am. And, um, and that's what spawned. For example, starting this um, Baroque ensemble that I have, which is Acronym. And it's a 12-piece ensemble based in New York. Lots of my friends from Oberlin. And we just play music that we just love. And we've made a bunch of records. And awesome. we're starting to get some great uh, opportunities performance-wise. And But they're just, they're just my best friends. And we love the music that we do. And... It's so important to me. Like, if we want to tell a story on stage as a person, mm -hmm. we have to believe in what we're doing. Right. So if I can't be in a position where I'm allowed to believe in what I'm doing, then it's not for me. Exactly. So exactly. And that's been my a huge part of, of that. And just yesterday I was in the car with my friend Bill, who I'm performing with tonight. And I, I was just like, this is happening because we're great friends. Right. I mean, it helps that he's a Grammy winner and <laughs> right. he's brilliant, but it's not the reason we're together right. playing because we're both so busy. Right. So but you it's, enjoy uh, it and you look forward to the time where you can reconnect and get back together to play the gig. Exactly. And I think that you're hitting on such an important topic that you can express to students and young musicians, but it kind of is the key, and that is who your friends are, the people that you do love and surround yourself with. You have to stay in touch with them. You yeah. have to like actively be a friend mm -hmm. because everybody does spread out and life gets crazy, but those are the people that you're going to end up coming back around to and playing with and seeing throughout your life journey. So if you yeah. were friends, don't lose them um, and really stick with it. And I think that's a hard thing for people as yeah. they get busy, then they get kind of myopic on the thing that they're doing. Right. But look at all of the riches you have because of that. You have these friends all over the place and all kinds of projects. And yeah. they're people from 15 years ago, 20 years ago that you've maintained. Definitely. And that's such a huge key, I think, to the fun of really being able to spread out across the country and the world mm -hmm. and look at how happy you are because of it. You've really have this beautiful network of people. Yeah, absolutely. And that makes playing so much more fun when yeah. you're playing with people that you love to play with. Yeah.
That's very, very exciting. Okay, so one thing that I love to ask everyone is exactly in, in that field is the magic of performing and the feeling that you get and the feeling that the audience gets on those special nights where it's just all clicked in and everybody can feel it. So I'd love to hear about a story that you were in, a performance that was just so meaningful to you where you could feel like everybody performing felt that, you know you had the audience. And then if there was a special performance that you were at where as the audience member you got to witness the performers click. If you can think about some of those moments. Wow. They're always so fascinating to hear what people kind of think of. Yeah. Um, I'm feeling very fortunate right now because my mind is being bombarded with memories of really great performances. Uh, and But I, I feel like what comes up more is um, this moment when I was doing a, a workshop in uh, New Zealand in the town of Napier with, with my friend William. And we had just finished um, performing for this for a school and maybe four, four or five hundred kids uh, on bleachers. And we just finished and it was a giant journey to get there, as you can imagine, <laughs> yes. from where I was living, Toronto and or wherever. It's just on the other side of the world for almost everyone. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> and so we, we, we finished playing and and everyone was was quiet and, and silent and there was no you know, cl- clapping, um, or what you would, I guess what we've come to expect after a concert. And, and all of a sudden, all these kids from the ages of like eight to 13 or 14 stood up and sort of started walking towards us and off of the bleachers onto the floor of the auditorium, which was kind of like a gym. And, uh, and then they, this little boy that about eight, um, like was quite close to both of us, maybe just a few feet away, and started screaming. Um, <laughs> and I was new to New Zealand, <laughs> and new to screaming. <laughs> new to screaming, and then I realized that these these four or five hundred kids were we're we're going to perform this ancient ritual for just the two of us called a haka and then it starts with like a call to arms basically it was a war dance and now it's just become much more of a cultural significant thing but and in that moment i just felt like incredibly moved by the fact that we had just shared what we loved and these you know, and afterwards the teachers like rushed up to us and they were like, you know, the kids, we, we don't tell them to do that. You know, they, this is a tradition that goes back, you know, many, many, many years. And, uh, it was just really amazing. Um, and, uh, so I think That's that incredible. might be, that might be one of those, yeah. one of those moments. So like, so strong in your mind and clearly it and affected visceral. them so much. Yeah. Yeah. That's neat that they would be willing to display their most treasured kind of expression. Yeah. That's and the, and the, just the, the how young they were mm-hmm. and how much emotion and strength and beauty there was in their language, in their bodies, in their voices, in their in their screaming. It was so loud. It was shook the building, you know. Wow. I just I loved that also just to feel the the intensity that is possible with all of us to get something across to someone else. Yes. You know, which is like the opposite of sort of the the casual like I don't really care right. vibe of a teenager that we sometimes get to know because it's apparently 
a great easy way to sort of conform to some, at least some situations, you right, know? Right, right. So it just felt like, oh my goodness. I And I kind of looked at, thought to myself, I never want to um, expect any less magnitude of energetic ability from any age or size human than this, if this is actually possible. Right. And it was happening. It's, so. it's amazing. And to be able to see that, you know, you can stir that emotion in young people and yeah. to treat them as important listeners yeah, and not just like, oh, well, they're little, they're not really going to get it, but maybe they'll enjoy watching me fiddle, but right. they really got the message. Yeah. Yeah. That's very powerful. It felt like that anyways. Yeah. yeah clearly. <laughs> if they're willing to scream at you, yeah. <laughs> they must have loved it. Yeah. Yeah. That's fabulous. Yeah. What about an opportunity that you had to witness that in another, somebody's recital or a performance, maybe when you were young, but something where you were like, aha, that's it. Wow. Oh, um, so many. Um, uh, I, I love, I loved, um, there's a, a, a woman that I work with sometimes in an orchestra in New York called The Knights, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great little band. We've toured together a little bit, and there's a singer and a well violinist in the orchestra that also sings, and her name is Christina Corton. And I remember going to one of her shows in Brooklyn and um, hearing her sing and feeling kind of those the moments that really get me are when I feel like there's no nothing left between what's happening and kind of your ears or where you are and uh, and I always search for that mm -hmm. as a performer too and so I remember feeling very sort of hopeful uh, in in that moment of the ability that you can have as an artist to translate so unequivocally and so um, easily, mm -hmm. uh, not that it's easy, but that the effect of it is easy, perhaps, um, of, of, of her songs, you know, that right. she had written and, and created and, and, uh, Feeling that ease and that beauty and that uh, strength, and that was uh, a moment for me, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, when I was young, uh, the, I just I was really lucky. I had I had so many opportunities to drive into Toronto. I grew up on a little tiny farm in the middle of nowhere, but I was a couple hours away from Toronto. So I could drive into Toronto. My well, my parents would drive me into Toronto, and I would get to see, you know, just some of the greatest artists, mm -hmm. and just sit there and and hear their stories. Right. You know. Exactly. With with, uh, um, with through music. Mm -hmm. So, uh, from the performance aspect of it, you're kind of talking about finding that place, finding the energy and how you kind of sink into the communication and kind of opening that up for yourself with the audience. Yeah. I feel like that's something that over time you can get to it. And, um, it's challenging for some people to kind of let go of the conscious and enter the subconscious and yes. kind of the whole, just relax. Everyone's like, ah, I can't relax. Yeah. But you know, this, this very special kind of clutch first gear shift into it's prepared. I'm prepared. Now I'm entering the new room and that's the room of giving and telling my story that how do you, how did you work on it or how did you bump into it? Or do you remember a night when it clicked for you or do you actively try and go there in your performances? Like how does that kind of transition help for you as you're playing? Yeah. Oh, that's an amazing 
uh, thought. Um, I mean, I grew up being so scared and nervous to play for anyone. I remember, you know, as a young teenager, my mom put me into these things called Kiwanis Music Festivals. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And even though they were not really judged in like a way of like first place, second place, third place, but they were still so scary. And I remember walking on stage and then running off for years. And my mom just kind of let it go. She was like, oh, I guess you're not ready or whatever. And I would hide under her skirt (laughs) and just be so, just wish I was anywhere else. Yeah. And and that slowly, I feel like that that's always been sort of a, a very real thing for me. And as I grew up or am growing up and I went to college and I, I just started thinking about the reasons why you might perform. And I feel like the concept of telling a story and sharing who you are through music... Uh, what really helped me through this crazy, you know, anxiety or nervousness or, or just totally freaking out was realizing that you couldn't get any of that across. And um, even as a human to another human, the energy that you hold and feel is translated so clearly. Mm-hmm. So if you're a nervous wreck, which we all are, but in the in the moment that you're trying to actually transfer a feeling or a musical note or anything, if you can kind of not focus on that part of it, it it's way easier to to tell a story or make someone feel good from a piece of music or sad or whatever they feel. One of the things I love is that you really have no control over the kind of emotion that someone might feel from what you do. But you have control over if that sort of, if it's open, if you're creating a space that's open enough for that to come and ebb and flow. Right. um, So over the years, I've thought a lot about that. And um, yeah, I, uh, I try not to. I try not to go there in my mind, even though it, it, of course it happens. And then, and then once you play for like 50,000 people, for example, (laughs) which I've, I have done, then you're like, okay, now I can do anything. Right. 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 And then this, this past year, um, uh, I got a bunch of, I was internet famous for like five minutes when I played at, um, uh, McCain's funeral. Yes. And so then I was like, okay, now I've played for 10 million people. So maybe now I don't never have to get nervous. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm finished now. But, but none of that is true. Right. It's always, right. a, it's always an, a battle. And I don't mean battle in a bad way. I just mean battle or struggle in a real way. Mm-hmm. And, um, I sometimes still get nervous if I'm playing for seven people and one of them is maybe a colleague that I really respect or, or um, something that reminds me of a really sad moment in my life, mm-hmm. and then I can't focus on anything else. So every single day is just a total new day as far as the world of being able to be a performer at all, mm-hmm. I think. But, but there are tools, I think, that you can, you can have, and, and one of mine has been just... Um, really understanding the road of the reason for why you're doing what you're doing. Right. And if you can map that out in your mind logically, then having too many blockages in that in that creates an inability to do what you're supposedly there to do. Yeah, what you're really truly set out for, which so, isn't just playing a zillion notes. Yeah. There's a bigger purpose. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's absolutely it. And I think a lot of us struggle because in, really everyone wants to get up there and do their best. And this the tiger in the cage of what if it's not my best is so big. And it's such an interesting thing when you do wish to say things and you know getting people to throw a curtain over the tiger cage and just worry about what you're trying to say. Yeah. Um, it's such an amazing journey for people. 
yeah. as they kind of go through it. And sometimes you accidentally realize, oh, I wasn't nervous that whole time. <laughs> Maybe yeah. I could do that again. <laughs> exactly. Um, so the McCain uh, funeral gig, if you will, that is a really interesting one because I feel like you know, through all these other projects you have and all the stuff that's going on, you've got these peppered, really interesting, unique kind of one-off gigs. So how did that come to be? And I saw you played a Smithsonian thing and this gig and that gig and like just these little ones. Is that network or how did you get that gig? Uh, just just friends. And just I would just say, show up to whatever you do and be who you are. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um I mean, the Smithsonian concert is is just a dear friend of mine, Ken Slowick, who runs the... He's the director of the Smithsonian Institute and takes care of all the instruments. And But that's also a long line of, of colleagues, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, in a, he's in a string quartet with my old teacher, Marilyn McDonald. Ah. They are the Smithsonian chamber players. Cool. They are... She and Mark Destrebay... Um, you know, they're in a quartet that plays the, those four really, 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 really famous strats, yep. you know, every few months or however many shows they do. And and I've worked with Ken Slowick in other festivals. The first time I ever played with him was in a, was, you know, in my early, I want to say early 20s, but it could have even been earlier than that in a festival in Canada called Domaine Forget. Mm-hmm. And we played the Onslow string quintet for two cellos. And uh, Jesse Irons was the other violinist who's, you know, now a colleague. Yep. But man, I felt like I couldn't even play the violin. It was yeah. such a hard piece for me. and But I was learning and I was trying and we are colleagues. And, and so... Um, this year can put together this idea of wanting to hire six violinists over the course of the season to do um, one Bach obligato sonata with him and one Mozart sonata with him on a harpsichord and forte piano respectively. Different uh, violins, you know, one's uh, at 415, one's mm-hmm. at 430 as well. And uh, this is for the A we're talking about. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, it was, I was so honored to be That's one of the, incredible. one of the violinists. And then, you know, the other violinists are like just friends. My old teacher, Marilyn, a colleague of mine from Tafel Music, Aislinn, Adrian Post is another violinist who is in a band with me, this band called Acronym. So it's just one That's of those really things. Cool. Um, and then of course, um, this isn't advertised at the Smithsonian because of the possibility that they don't have enough historical evidence, but I'm pretty sure I was playing Thomas Jefferson's violin. Wow. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> so there's that. That's pretty so amazing. Just like those historic moments. And yeah. I think that's, I grew up right outside of Washington, D.C., and I think that Washington, D.C. is so fun because you can walk into those buildings and it's all right there. Yeah. You can really see it and be around it. Um, and it's so incredible. I, all those museums I just absolutely adore. Yeah. Um, but it's so neat that, you know, throughout your schedule that you've got these little moments to look forward to yeah. to kind of jump back in with people. Yeah, um, absolutely. And that brings me to a question I'm always dying to know about, adrenaline. Like, how can you have this kind of a schedule and not crash? Oh. What is, how do you do that? Oh, I crash I would, all I would the time. I love some of your adrenaline because <laughs> I feel like we're all just so busy. There's so many projects. Everyone's doing so many things. But just the travel and watching mm-hmm. you kind of bounce all over the world, plus the different gigs, plus the genres, plus a lot of them are things that you're spearheading. So you're doing marketing, you're doing this, you're booking gigs, you're meeting people, you're staying in rooms. That's so much energy. Yeah. How do you manage that? Or have you found your threshold or if you passed the threshold and gone, ooh, that's too much? Yeah. Like, how have you worked that out for yourself? Excellent question. Um, I have definitely um, danced around the threshold. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, and I mean, I do crash, uh, as, as I think we all do. Um, but it's also so invigorating to play. Um, but I mean, of course, at the end of the night, you can't, I, I can't go to sleep even if I want to, because yeah. I'm my, I'm, you know, your body is vibrating. Yes. So you learn how to, you know, even like last night we went out just for an hour after the show with some friends um, because it just is that moment to realize that your performance is over yeah, and that it's time to, you know, let the heartbeat relax and, and all of that. Um, I, uh, so I mean, everything, I feel super fortunate to say this and, but everything that I'm doing right now is what I really, really want to be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have very recently, made some significant changes. Um, I'm going to uh, put a hold on a lot of my touring for the next couple of years um, uh, because I just started a PhD. That's exciting. Um, And I've just, I've always wanted to do more reading and thinking and exploring and, and discussing and there's just never time. Right. Um, so I'm settling into a PhD, uh, on the West coast in California and, uh, definitely doing a lot less touring. Um, and, uh, but, but other, other things that I, I do to just, um, keep, you know, keep the, the ability to, to be at your height when you need to perform and when you do perform, which I do a lot, um, is also, I would say, just um, taking care of your body, you know. Mm-hmm. like, And that's one of the reasons it's great to tour with the friends that I do tour with because we all appreciate, you know, going on hikes regularly, even on a busy touring day. Right. And, um, and going for runs in the morning before a flight and eating, you know, finding those beautiful gems in all the towns to eat locally and um, uh, eat, you know, farm to table. And those are, those are the things I love about, about touring as well. Just finding the, the most beautiful places in the community that you're in Mm -hmm. that care about all of those things Mm -hmm. because they are everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, There might just be one tiny little hole in the wall if it's a small enough town or city that you're playing in, but they exist everywhere because it's a necessity in a community. So someone will have tried. Someone will filled you know, it, yeah. And filled it. And and so that's been a, a big thing for me. Um, but, uh, I mean, yeah, even on uh, days where it's been a lot of performances in a row every single day, um, usually by the time an evening concert happens and we have some like really, really nice, like raw organic dark chocolate in the <laughs> green room yep. before the show and I am on stage with my friends, you know, I, I, I have to say I've never ended up, I've never been on stage and thought I shouldn't be here or I can't be here or I don't have the energy to be here. Mm-hmm. I've always found found that. And I think humans, we are so, we have, there's so much reserve, you know. Yes. And I don't, th- I'm not suggesting we tap into that all the time. Right. But um, lately I've also, as I mentioned earlier, been composing, right? Mm-hmm. So that's an incredibly beautiful thing to do for those moments of the year or the month that you want to be a hermit. Right. Which everyone needs. And yes. I feel like as a performer, you need it even more. Mm-hmm. Um, any stage time has to, I feel like, directly reflect into being completely and utterly alone. Yeah. In, for example, m- one of my, um, you know, sweet places in the world that I love, which is Big Sur, for example. Mm-hmm. So I have, um, I have these places where... I've been allowed to go and hide in Big Sur and write or mm-hmm. relax or read and 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 I have a couple of those places around the world and that's just absolutely so important. 
Yeah, I, it's very nice to hear that because I feel like, especially now that everyone is so interconnected online and everyone's posting pictures and videos and you're seeing people gallivanting all over, mm-hmm. there's not a lot of discussion about, and I'm out, I need a week, I need two days, I need one day. Yes. I'm so tired, I'm sore, I'm done for right now. Yeah. You don't hear about that. And so I think kids are like, okay, oh, there's so much to do. And you see people that are like, just robotic there's they have so much energy and they just never right. stop and of course performing gives you energy but a lot of times it also gives you adrenaline mm-hmm. which sucks out your energy so kind of this how do you um, rejuvenate and let it become cyclical so that you're feeding back into yourself and not just pouring out yes I think it's one of the big questions yeah totally. um, and very important and and what about um just preparation do you feel like right now the kinds of gigs that you're playing um it sounds like it's a really fun mix of a lot of baroque but a lot of improvisatory and and celtic and kind of folk and other things that's not really the same as like hashing out your first violin part in a string quartet where it's just pages and pages of notes are you in a space where you just keep everything percolating and maintaining and you're watching your schedule kind of click by or do you go, okay, I've got this big thing coming up in six months. I'm going to start stewing on it now. How do you deal with all that? Right, yeah. Um, Well, one of the things that takes a lot of my time is the fact that, for example, in the duo that I have and the trio that I'm just starting with William and a mandolinist, Ashley, we do everything from memory. Mm -hmm. Because that's another really important facet in my journey for figuring out the best way that I want to be a performer. Right. And I just feel like that's another wall. Right. And and it's not always possible to to, um, get rid of the music. But uh, all of our concerts right now that we have planned and, and are doing are, you know, at least 95% memorized. Sometimes we add a new piece and we need a couple weeks to figure it out. But um, so that does take a lot of time and you can't ignore that responsibility because you will not necessarily forget how to play something, but you will, your mind will think that you forget. (laughs) Yes, yes. Which is base, which is what you're really juggling with. You're not, I mean, our minds are incredible and our memory is incredible, but our psyche or whatever you want to call it will second guess what we actually can do. And then, and then you, you know, then you have these slips, um, which happen to everyone, you know? Um, so that's a thing that I keep, I keep on top of Mm -hmm. really a lot. And, uh, in composition, I'm, I'm a super slow learner and doer so I need to really think about those commissions like a year in advance at least Mm -hmm. um because I also feel like you cannot be rushed in that in that genre that just doesn't work it doesn't compute with my brain so um so you passed a simmer (laughs) yeah exactly and um uh but yeah, I think that is definitely part of the uh, the beauty of of doing all the the projects that I have chosen to do. Um, in the beginning of February, my band Acronym is doing a modern premiere of a very old Scarlatti opera. Cool. At the um, I think it's called the Isabel Stewart Gardner oh, Museum. Boston? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's going to be amazing. Yeah, so so you know, I've been looking at that material. It's not we're not going to memorize that. Obviously, it's mm-hmm. a giant score. But um that just takes a little bit of time every now and then and um uh but there's we try to when I'm on tour, I really try to have a little bit of downtime every single day to do a bit of like checking up on the schedule and understanding right. what's coming. Right. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, if there's a concerto coming up that I really need to focus on, I'll just put it time aside. 
Um, and what I've started to also do, which feels really good, is, you know, like like we were, we were talking about, is put days or weeks or whatever I think I really need aside to be the hermit mm-hmm. that I know that I love to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, And then once I have that also literally in my schedule mm-hmm. as unavailable time, that feels really good. Yeah, absolutely. And then you know you can let the energy reserves refill. Yeah. And it makes it more fun to go out and, and be with other people and, exactly. and give your energy if you have had a chance to let it fill up. Yeah. So for my last question, um, what are some things that you think uh, or how would you kind of provide guidance to if you had a – young chamber group or a young group of friends who were going to go out and try and get something going. What do you, what would you suggest or some things they need to think about to start getting their name out there and booking gigs and kind of getting their show on the road? Right. Wow. Um, well, I would, I would strongly recommend finding out what really makes you happy and what you do. Um, you know, whatever, instrument you play or genre that you sing or anything like that Um, because the amount of work it's going to take you uh, I think you're going to need to really love it Mm -hmm. Um, also same with the colleagues and friends that you're working with be ready to to share a lot of time together Mm -hmm. Um, and if that feels right then you're probably already just going to make it Mm -hmm. Because that's uh, been so important in my world and in my journey. Um, I would say uh, also for, especially in the classical world, I don't think we realize how important it is to record our own music. Uh, Whatever we do, I don't mean our own compositions necessarily, but Record something that you are working on or with your friends or a string quartet or don't be embarrassed or frightened by the idea of recording like another version of Haydn Opus 20 because there is no version that you are on with that Haydn Opus 20 and yeah. And maybe it, for starters, it will be your mom and your cousin and <laughs> yeah. your sister that'll listen to it. Yeah. And that's amazing, yeah. you know, but that's how it starts. So I think recording mm-hmm. uh, is a huge thing that, you know, doesn't really get discussed in any real way in the schools that I went to. Yeah, same. And it's kind of, you know, people were always, you know, every now and then someone would be like, oh, well, you know, you should probably have a business card or something. And then <laughs> I'd be so like, true. oh, really? So that's what I need to, that's how I go from being a master's student to a full-time professional musician that pays rent. Business card. You know, yeah. and it's just like, no, that's, you know, maybe that's a nice thing to have. I haven't had one in years uh, just because of the internet. Right. Um, so, but like recordings of yourself and I can't tell you how many people have found out about what I do on some random Spotify playlist or yeah. a little YouTube video or, um, or things like that, uh, I think are brilliant. And, uh, That's so, awesome. yeah, so I don't know, do play the things that you really love to play. Uh, spend time playing with the people you really love to spend time with and make something with those people or your instrument that you really feel like you would love to share. And then you'll be fine, Mm -hmm. uh, I think. Because, you know, people are like, oh, the world is saturated. But what we really want is we really want a community. So people fall in love with you as a person or with you as an artist or with your type of playing or with your weird and crazy duo with like a baritone saxophone and a, and, a, and you know, a piccolo. Mm-hmm. It's just fun and unique to follow someone's journey. Right. Um, so if you have a weird idea, I would say go for it. Yeah, go ahead and put it out there. And yeah. It's, it's going to stick. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for this. Of it's course. It's been so great to chat with you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Inside the Notes. I'm your host, Erica Block. Be sure to check the Inside the Notes Facebook page for details on our next guest.